Well, the role of AI in the post-pandemic world, emerging technologies like AI and ML are helping the world come up with smarter ways to deal with the current pandemic that has impacted the world in the unforeseen ways. Many countries are leveraging AI to detect infections, inform healthcare systems, and deploy rapid actions to curb its spread. Right now for our panel discussion, it's gonna be on the topic coronavirus outbreak, how cloud technologies, AI, ML are helping us deal with this pandemic. We're looking at talking about putting AI at the core of an organization, business and operating models, exploring the way AI will impact the future of work, accelerating digital transformation using AI data analytics and hybrid cloud, solving uncertain and variable supply and demand in the market through data analytics. We're also looking at geopolitics of AI, using AI and data analytics to predict and support operations and supply disruption, suboptimal work post allocation and changing consumer confidence and priorities. Ladies and gentlemen, for this, we've joined by our eminent panelists. First up, Ram Prakash Ramamurthy, a Director of AI and ML Research, Soho Corporation, India. Ram Prakash is a passionate leader with a level-headed approach to emerging tech. He's somebody who kick-started the AI efforts with Soho Corporation and built its AI platform from scratch. We're also joined by Sethi the head of uh, department at, at ICD, Digital Services, Jakarta Provincial Government, Indonesia. Well, Sethi is an accomplished leader with experience in working with governments and public sector organizations to ease the life of citizens of Jakarta with the help of its technology. We're also joined by Tony Seno Hartano, the IT expert, Indonesia Hospital Association, Indonesia. Tony, being a multi-talented technologist with over 30 years of experience as a practitioner, public speaker, educator, consultant at some of the top global IT companies. We're also joined by Bhima Thiaja, the VP of Data and Growth, the Buka Lapak, Indonesia. Bhima leads the uh, data scientists, visualization experts, and engineering at Buka Lapak, to utilize its rich data assets to create data-driven insights, dashboards, and machine learning products. We're also going to be joined by our moderator, Gregorius Bimantaro, the chairman, CEO, Indonesia Health Tech Association and Thomo Medical Indonesia. Well, called to be a medical doctor, Gregorius' passions lie in uh, developing sustainable innovations that improve people's quality of life. He's also the founder and CEO of the Atoma Medical and the co-founder, which is now called the ThaniaDoc.com. Well, with this, I'd now like to uh, invite all our eminent panelists on the stage, and I'd now like to pass the live baton to our moderator, who uh, likes to be called Dr. Bhima on the stage and screen. Uh, so Dr. Bhima, over to you uh, with your eminent panel to take it forward. Thank you. So uh, I hope this morning or everything is good and we are in a spirit uh, and we are going to have a session until 11.45, uh, right? So hopefully this 45 minutes will inspire you all and uh, will ignite something that eventually at the end will help more and more work in AI. So we see the healthcare delivery requires the support of the new technologies uh, right now. And we are learning to fight and look ahead against the disease and make a healthier living. So uh, let's start from Mr. Uh, Ramprakas. Okay. Uh, you, you, you have a lot of uh, a long background in uh, AI and develop your, even your own solution in Zoho. Uh, in general, how can you share about the opinion in a business leaders to enhance IT using AI? Thank you, Dr. Bhima. Uh, I think this is a great question. So, so IT has come to the forefront, especially after the pandemic. We have seen a lot of digital first or digital only brands, digital only storefronts. And uh, so that makes IT very crucial to business post pandemic. Now, this is where AI comes in. In fact, in IT, we have had uh, just so much abuse of the word intelligence, right? Any any scheduled routine is intelligence. Any uh, thing that meets a static threshold is intelligence. Uh, uh, but now we have entered into the world of artificial intelligence where instead of writing specific rules, you look at past data points and then you try and elastically create rules which takes care of your seasonal factors, your trend factors, and then even the random noise that gets adds into your variable. 
So now that IT has become very crucial, uh, the looming rise of security threats, the looming rise of insider threats, uh, privileged uh, attacks and things like that, uh, we need something special, something like AI that can beautifully look at all of your past data and then bring in very valuable value additions to the table. Uh, interestingly, we can see AI in IT in a lot of spaces. It can be in monitoring where you can proactively monitor, find out outages, find out root causes for your outages. In security, where you can do, like I said, insider threat detection, uh, password leakage, malware detection, uh, and things like that. And user and entity behavior analysis, where you continuously monitor your users and entity for finding out if they are compromised, right? And then, and then from a service delivery perspective, right? A lot of redundant work happens in service delivery where somebody reads the ticket and assigns it to an agent, but now all of that can be automated. So broadly, I would summarize saying AI in IT can help in revenue maximization and process optimization. That would be my point. Thank you. I think it's very interesting about the security and we are talking about healthcare, right? This related healthcare. I am going to back. I am going uh, back to you with that uh, uh, question later. So, uh, Mr. Tony, you 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 are now in the in a hospital industry. Uh, this been impacted both in a good and negative way during pandemic, right? So it's it's been a huge slip with the digital health, etc. But you have years of experience in the IT industry, like uh, 30 years. So how do you see AI will impact uh, working now and in the future and you can also add uh, the way of work in in, uh, in the healthcare or the way doctors work. I mean, it will be very interesting to, to hear from you. Okay, uh, AI artificial intelligence is one of the most important technology in the world uh, today. Uh, it's one of the key component of uh, digital transformation and it is integrated in all processes and fundamentally change how uh, the business operates and deliver value to the customers. So this is what I see. And uh, in general, I see artificial intelligence implementation everywhere. Maybe without uh, we ever notice yeah. For example, uh, AI in the smartphone, it makes uh, the smartphone able to uh, authenticate the user easier and also take better photo etc and uh, inside the application i make application easier and more more fun to to use uh, i'm in the hospital association so in the context of hospital ai can also be found in many areas one area related to uh, to it is the covid pandemic uh, is that uh, ai solution can actually detect covid 19 on chest x-ray for example with a higher accuracy. So uh, based on some research, it can be 10 times faster than uh, the human radiologist can do. And uh, for example, one, one of the solution uh, 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 can take 18 minutes to scan uh, about 300 uh, X-ray with the accuracy of 82%. It's higher than the human radiologist. Uh, the human radiologist normally around uh, 76 to 81%. Uh, this solution is actually not uh, expensive. It's very affordable and uh, can be implemented uh, across the nation in Indonesia. Uh, now, however, uh, the power of AI also raises some concern in the uh, hospital stakeholders. For example, uh, most of us are afraid that, that AI will replace the doctor. So, but, but in my opinion, this concern may be not correct. AI just a tool. So AI will not replace the human because uh, it's just a tool, even though it's a very good tool. And actually uh, use, uh, we can use it as a tool to com complement a radiologist. So for example, uh, using AI alone, AI cannot confirm whether somebody infected uh, by COVID or not but uh, AI can help the radiologist to speed up and improve the accuracy. So for example, to detect is someone infected by COVID or not. So using AI, the, the diagnosis will be much more accurate. Uh, in my opinion, this needs some education uh, for the people inside the uh, healthcare industry to understand more about AI. 
and uh, related to this era that we are living now in the COVID pandemic era, there is nothing, uh, there is no better time than today to implement the AI actually. So uh, in this in this era, we we are experiencing the new normal. We have to limit the physical interaction, and uh, a lot of AI function can be used to help us. And uh, if we are talking about the post pandemic uh, uh, era, if we we ever get there, yeah, based on some uh, some research done by McKinsey, uh, BBC, and a local is, uh, research uh, institution, something from uh, UGM. I'm also a researcher there. And uh, the change that we are experiencing today will be still there. So, so uh, we'll stay the same even until the pandemic is over. So which means AI development and implementation is unstoppable. So I think if we are talking about AI in the current era, there is no better time uh, as today. So it's time for AI to be implemented also in the healthcare industry. So that's my opinion. So I think there is uh, two big highlights there from your side. So just put it like the, another stethoscope, new one. Is that right? right? Just the tools, right? AI is tools. Right? Just a stethoscope for doctors. Right? Exactly. Then, so AI is just a tool, but a very good tool. Some, but yeah. a lot of people frightened about this tool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and second, uh, the so so it already changed the way that the healthcare are working, right? So uh, the I think the consumer behavior, the professional behavior, working behavior has been changed a lot. And uh, still with this pandemic, so is that the one that you say that the digital transformations, accelerations with AI, etc., also happening because of COVID? Is that is that true, Mr. Tony? Yeah, uh, when we are talking about the digital transformation, is actually the implementation or adoption of a digital technology to transform the existing services, and it it's actually uh, if we are talking about the digital transformation, it's not only cover about the technology itself. But uh, the people, the policy, uh, the regulation, best practice, it's involved all of those uh, area. So uh, AI is just one of the component of the digital transformation technology that enable the transformation. So there are other uh, technology, for example, uh, cloud computing, data analytic, and the others. Uh, because mm. if we are talking about AI and people want to implement AI, uh, maybe the AI cannot be done locally. So for example, it needs certain amount of CPU power, etc. And maybe that institution doesn't have the capability. So that's why uh, cloud computing is uh, very important too in here. So cloud computing is the foundation of AI, data analytic, and the other function. Yeah. So uh, using all of those uh, technology today, uh, all of those technology can be uh, synergized together to push the digital transformation become reality. We have been talking about the digital transformation since several years ago, but the adoption, especially in Indonesia, is very slow. Uh, but now we have the catalyst, the right catalyst, which is uh, pandemic, COVID pandemic. We don't have any choice other than we transform ourselves. And uh, we are, if we are talking about digital transformation, it can be ours, yeah, but, but uh, I think uh, digital transformation is a must. So for uh, industry in the healthcare, for government, for school, yeah, everything must be transformed. And uh, if we are talking about AI, AI is just one tool uh, within the digital transformation that enable the use of machine to think, yeah, so uh, this, this is very unique because uh, uh, before uh, the AI, we only use the machine and we are the one who must think, yeah, must operate. Yes. And uh, yeah, but uh, in this time of pandemic, a lot of people may be not accustomed to use the technology, but AI can help them. AI can make a complicated thing easier and uh, if we are now facing uh, the lack of doctors yeah, to to you know to fight the pandemic, AI can help. If uh, we we need to detect somebody, if uh, are you infected by COVID or not, AI can also help. So there's a lot of things that we can we can do within the hospital, within the healthcare or other sector. 
that's related to AI. Thank you, Mr. Tony. So I think there's a highlight there, actually, that uh, we need to also understand that the regulation still work with an on-premise model only, right? For the for the hospital. Okay, talking about regulation, uh, but well, I, I don't think Mr. Stiaji will talk about regulation. Uh, he is in government. Uh, I met him still in Jakarta, now in Bandung, West Java province. And uh, we heard that West Java is one of the provinces that successfully reduced the numbers of COVID-19 active infection uh, last uh, last month. Right? So how is using AI or ML uh, and data analytics actually help in fighting COVID-19? Mr. Stiaji, thank you, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you, uh, Bimo. Uh, okay, for handling COVID-19 in West Java, we do five values or principles. First, proactive, the second, transparent, and then the third, scientific, and then the fourth, innovative, and the last, collaborative. After the, the announcement of the first case of COVID-19, uh, actually the first case is in the West Java, in the Depok. We were uh, proactive and immediately formed the West Java COVID-19 Information and Coordination Center, uh, we call the PICOBAR, and also activated the, our common centers, the UN common center in West Java, as a, its a personal center for the uh, COVID-19 management. And we also took uh, some innovative uh, approach, such as uh, preparing the PICOBAR applications, which currently has more than 35 features. Some of the existing features, uh, utilize uh, AI and also um, machine learning technology. Yeah, this technology is uh, really help us to speed up uh, handling of COVID-19 and overcome uh, our limited human resource, uh, such as uh, handling a complaint channels using the uh, chatbot and also monitoring the crowds, conducting the independent checks and also other things. And in handling COVID-19, we also adhere to the data principles. Yeah. In order to support decision making, we carry out the data analysis, such as uh, analysis of conditions, trends to enforce the activity restrictions, uh, PSBB, and also identify the hotspot for the spread of uh, COVID-19. And also we analyze the data on social yeah, assistance recipients to ensure the accuracy of uh, social assistance. Until now, we have uh, prepared more than 50 dashboards for the COVID-19 and also 100 analysis to help the, uh, the governors uh, for the decisions. So you have 50 dashboard, five zero. Yes, yes. How, how you prioritize the, I mean, there's a lot of parameter there, right? So in, 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 in a BI sense, I mean, the business intelligence sense, how you prioritize that, which one is going to affect uh, the most for the public health or for economic perhaps or so? Yeah, uh, talking uh, COVID-19, yeah, we talk about the health and also the economics. Yeah, So the first things now, uh, yeah, we, we still wait the vaccine yeah, uh, until uh, finishing. And uh, we, what we want to do is to make restric restrictions like the micro uh, restrictions. And also uh, we use the AI for monitors, the protocol uh, violence. Yeah using the AI and etc. So we managed not to increase, but we still open uh, for uh, make sure the economic is grown. Yeah, so we, okay. we have some dashboard for economic growth and also for the health, uh, especially for the poor, yeah, for the affability of the bed and etc. Yeah. So we are talking a lot of data there. Uh, Mr. Bima. So let's continue from the e-commerce point of view, right? Uh, I understand that e-commerce is, I mean, the recommendation engine, it's, 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 it's very, very uh, important for the business also, right? It's, which and during pandemic, everyone is moving to online shopping. So I don't know, I'm not going to ask how is your growth because you're also VP of growth, right? But <laughs> can you define like working in a data-driven organization? I mean, it is very rare in the healthcare when uh, the healthcare organization is as data driven. Can you help define that first? And we are going to continue uh, more question after that. All right, sure. Thanks, Dr. Bimo. So um, when we talk about e-commerce and, and during the, the pandemic era, we, we see a lot of shift essentially. Um, now, you know, behaviors have changed, not just within online shopping, behaviors overall have changed about, you know, how we conduct things, right? Like this conference itself is done online, whereas traditionally it would be done physically. So. Um, 
number one that we try to achieve with data is to adapt quickly. Like the thing that actually data empowers the most, uh, in my opinion, is for us to adapt quickly and to take action upon it. So um, in e-commerce, you know, the shift in demand, the shift in supply, there was suddenly a surge of like masks and sanitizers uh, when, the, when the pandemic starts. So we had to, uh, you know, action upon that data. Now, in terms of being a data-driven organization, uh, to be a successful one, the, old, the teams or the people that are data-driven can't just be the analytics team or the data science team. It has to be the whole company. So, you know, one of the things that we did as a company is make uh, one of our camp company values to be jangan baper liat data, which means don't be emotional. Just look at the data, right? Um, so it's not about who has the best opinion or who has the most experience. It's about who has the right data set and who can interpret and action on that right data set. So that's how we, we, we've been able to achieve, you know, a, a, our organizational sort of um, stance to all look at data and make sure that we action upon this data. Because having data doesn't mean much until you can action upon that data. So AI and ML is one way of actioning towards it. And we do have lots of algorithms that we built to, to make sure, you know, such as demand prediction, supply prediction, um, matchmaking algorithms like recommendation engine and search engines. Um, these are all data products that allow us to, you know, essentially grow, grow the economy. But for us, it's about, well, if there is a shift in, a, you know, in, in the demand or in the supply that is caused by something outside, like it is not induced by Bukalapak, like, you know, it's a pandemic. Um, how can we, you know, run uh, fluidly and, and, and in an agile manner so that to use data and to actually serve our customers a lot better? Um, but I think the core of it is that to be a data-driven organization, everybody has to be able to look at data. Everybody has to be able to interpret data and action upon data. Um, if you do not have that in your organization, then there is, you know, still a way to go in terms of being an, uh, a data-driven organization. Interesting. So I think Mr. Tony and Mr. Sriaji, you you should not get heart attack when the board pet occupancy rate reaches ninety percent, right? <laughs> so dangan baper. So, but we want to act on that. So I think uh, I will get back to you, Mr. Bimas. I will uh, go to Mr. Ramprakas again. Uh, you have been talking about security, right? I mean, healthcare organization, even like. In a, in a in a hospital clinics and even from the uh, district government until national uh, government, security matters a lot in healthcare. Right? Even the privacy and security is the one reason that it's not too easy right, to implement something. Even like Indonesia, we don't have the regulation that allow hospital to have an on cloud EMR. Correct, right, Mr. Tony. That's right. So. Can can you uh, explain more about about the security point of view uh, you said about the AI? How could help this help? Sure, thank you. Uh, so interestingly, uh, IT has always been in the back office. Now, like you said, uh, hospitals have this HIPAA regulation, and uh, uh, there is a lot of apprehensiveness. So basically, we want AI uh, to bring in cancer care, but uh, we don't want AI to jack up our insurance prices just because I can be a potential diabetic or a potential cancer patient. So it's it, there's a lot in the play of data here. Now, IT has come to the forefront here. And interestingly, post-pandemic, you're no longer restricted by, uh, let's say, uh, the device in which you access your data or the network in which you access your data. With the advent of cloud, except maybe healthcare, all the other industries have started bring your own device, bring your own network. So previously we had to go to our offices, we had a physical machine, we had to access the data only via that portal. But now you can access it from anywhere on earth and, and that brings in a whole lot of security headache, right? So, so, so this is where intelligent user and entity behavior monitoring comes in where you fingerprint and user's behavior, find out what is normal. Okay, this person comes always comes in a Safari browser. He always comes in a Google Chrome browser. He has these add-ons installed and he's always up to date or, or he never comes up to date. Now his user agent has been faked and things like that. So, so when, when it is a five variable or a 10 variable play, you can use some statistical analysis to do over it. But you have like about 100 to 200 variables that you have to look at and decide if it is the same person or is somebody impersonating him? So this is where AI powered user and entity behavior analysis can come in and fingerprint and user's behavior and identify if he is the right person to do the right operation. 
And of course, when you monitor, there is, let's say there is a, a malware attack or there is a DDoS attack on your system, you need to know what is the latency or what is the average number of users at a given point of time in a given machine. Let's say, for example, we run a B2B, B2B setup, then the traffic is very low on weekends. Right. We, let's say we do a B2C shopping center. The traffic is very high on weekends. So what is normal on a Monday morning 9 a.m. might not be normal on a Saturday morning 3 a.m. Right. So from a from a monitoring perspective, from a business perspective, you need to make sure you need to guarantee your uptimes. You need to make sure your site is always good. It, it responds in good time. Uh, it, it, there is no potential security threats there. So again, it's a multitude of flavors. IT is being unified. Security comes in, then monitoring comes in. Now, now there comes in an issue and your user raises a ticket via the service delivery tool. Now that has to be addressed proactively. Right. So, so it has to be assigned to the right person. Now, probably if it is an L1 question, you just look at your frequently asked questions and give them the answer right away without having a human agent, thereby in increasing the productivity of your employees. So IT in general provides a lot of value addition to uh, any kind of business, including hospitals and medical world. And now AI has come to spruce up things because IT has come to the forefront uh, it is it is not an optional item. IT is mandatory in running a digital business today. So AI is really going to help there and help us better mitigate security threats. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambraka. So back to Mr. Bima. Uh, I think there's a need to to implement or scale the the AI in the organizations, and uh, we we should we don't have to talk about our healthcare organization only, but all kind of organization. Can you share what's your secret to create the insight and machine learning model at scale in your organizations? And uh, I don't know if you if you have something uh, suggestion, perhaps healthcare. That would be great. All right. Okay. So uh, for me, let's let's define first, like you know, um, AI or ML or data analytics. At the end of the day, most of us are trying to solve a problem. It's a it's a at the very far front a problem solving technique it could be a business problem it could be a technical problem but it's a problem solving technique and to do this it actually takes a lot of creativity i actually put the you know sort of data science um it, it, within the, the creative field because we are essentially trying to create something um, out of the techniques that we have that might not be there before a decision um, engine that we don't have before a, a prediction engine that we don't have before so you are you are required to have a lot of creativity here now so but then to channel that creativity through out in a product that is being used by a lot of people that requires you know certain amount of infrastructure and tools but more importantly the way you organize these information these tools and these infrastructures now um, within Bukalapak, not everybody is a full-blown uh, ai engineer or data scientist so we have to acknowledge that our consumers of data um, are and people that are creating these insights might not all be super technical. Some of them could be business people. Some of them could come from customer service. So for, for the first layer, you have to identify who are your data consumers, who are your data users that are using this data creatively to create insights or predictions. Um, they could be, again, full-blown data scientists that create recommendation engines or prediction engines, or they could just be customer service staff that want to know, hey, is this type of ticket um, rising up? Are we seeing a lot of problems like these? Or they just want to know that, which type of ticket should I should I prioritize first? Which users are actually more impactful to, to look after or which problems are actually more dangerous and we have to look after them first before others? Um, so to do that, you, I, you know, organizations should have a thing that I call information architecture. Now, this is not an architecture about how, you, how your stack behaves, but in terms of how human behaves against information. Say, for example, if you want to find out how to, how to bake a cake, what would you do? You would Google it. Right? Or you would go on YouTube and you'll find a way to bake a cake. Now, when it comes to data analytics or consumption of data, people actually have the same approach. You have a hypothesis. All right, let's go back to the customer service one. Is this problem rising up, right? They would have a default way of accessing that information. Now, we can, you know, typically what happens when people build up a data organization is they build so much data assets that it becomes very convoluted and very messy. This is, uh, I take uh, information architecture as the way to organize and cluster that information or those tools to make sure that it is driven for the right type of people. So for example, some people, some, some of the approaches are, you have a search engine for data assets, right? So, you know, there are products out there that do this. You can search, I wanna look at, you know, the number of transactions by users in Kalimantan. 
right? You can search for that, that comes out. But then that might not be directly intuitive for some people. You know, the most common way that people organize dashboards or data assets in their head is usually they save links. They bookmark dashboards in their browser or they save the links to the dashboard somewhere in, in, in like a notepad. So then how do you combine the search engine and sort of this behavior as default um, by data? Now in Bukalapak, we have what we call a graph dictionary, which is essentially a dictionary of all the data points that we have in Bukalapak that you can search, gives you a snippet, but also acts as sort of a, a link directory for, for all of the information that we have in Bukalapa. Um, people will come in there as a first point of touch. We have also structured this in a tree manner or a decision tree manner in that, you know, the most important graphs that get uh, hit the most are on top and the ones that get hit the less are on the bottom. Now, you might say that this is not necessarily AI or ML. No, but this is a lot, a lot of the fundamentals around AI and ML because a lot of the fundamentals around AI and ML is feature engineering. And to create good features, you have to know the data that you're dealing with. And to know the data that you're dealing with, you have to know, you know, you have to look at essentially BI graphs a lot of the time. I mean, yes, there is a field in deep learning about, you know, um, un, sorry, it's abstract layer uh, features. But um, when we talk about the, the core and essence of, of uh, extracting, you know, information and synthesizing it by a machine to a decision, um, you know, this is, this is how we've been structuring it. So it's about number one, knowing who your consumers are of your data tools and data assets. Um, having the right tools and assets um, around data. So, you know, the right notebooks, uh, uh, tools to uh, infrastructure around machine learning training and machine learning uh, deployment um, around creating insights and, you know, causality inference, um, things like that. And the third is how do you match them uh, using information architecture to see the right people having the right access to the right tools and having their access to the right data set within the understandable definition that is standard for the whole company um, so that they speak the same language um, throughout the whole company. So I think that that is sort of how you achieve it at scale. If you have that, um, everybody speaks the same data language because data also has its own language. Everybody speaks the same data language, access to it, access to it very fluidly, then they can take actions on it very, very quickly as well. So that is that is sort of how we've tried to approach this, this um, insights and ML at scale within Bukalapak. Really interesting. So I think government, Mr. Satyaji, and hospital industry can also adapt this uh, approach, right? I think it's very interesting. So we we, we are getting back to the to, to the human, right? Uh, the four piece getting back to the people, uh, how they're going to use it. So we are waiting questions from audience, but actually uh, we can have some more bonus question to Mr. Uh, Tony and Mr. Satyaji actually uh, while waiting for the audience, if they have any questions, uh, you can put uh, with a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a platform. So uh, Mr. Tony, uh, we, we have seen uh, the, the implementation of AI in radiology, in, in chatbot, in, in a lot of stuff in a, in a healthcare industry uh, during COVID-19. And you also state that uh, this is the change uh, that we that we need the catalysator that, that we need to to move into the digital transformation. But actually, uh, do you do have like some kind of uh, approach like uh, Mr. Bima already shared about the data language, etc., that proven to work in hotel in a healthcare uh, organizations that okay we are ready to. Uh, accept this and move on. Uh, technology is part of our daily living. Uh, it's not a strange, not a strange things. I know it's not a Netflix uh, story. It's strange things. Okay. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, the stakeholders in the hospital begin to understand that uh, AI and other technology is a mandatory for them, at least to transform the hospital business into the the next one, which is a smart hospital. And uh, uh, the, the problem is maybe they don't, they don't know uh, what is the best step or what is the best approach. So uh, what I'm doing now is uh, I'm, do, I'm still doing some experimenting, but I think this approach could be, uh, could be work well. Uh, so I start with the uh, data analytics. So as you, as we already know, there there are a lot of data in the hospital. So since they are uh, 
uh, begin operating. So they have been collecting a lot of data, but the problem is they don't know what is inside the data. What can they, uh, what the data tell them about uh, their patient, the, their services. So uh, very few or maybe none of the hospital uh, think about that. And if they think about that, they don't know where to start. So I start with the business intelligence. So by helping the hospital to analyze the data so they can get some, some more insight. And by analyzing the data, they know that, okay, maybe they, their data is not rich enough. So uh, the next stage is to, to uh, change the architecture of the data to, uh, to make it richer. Yeah, so they, uh, they know that now they have to collect some other information oh, and and this this is part of the journey and um, in the in the long run so uh, they are planning to implement a uh, data warehouse so so because uh, the problem existing problem in the hospital they have a lot of database inside the hospital and each database is not interconnected and uh, the problem if we want to analyze all of those data we we are we will be faced by a lot of uh, uh, database that is not standard. So there's a lot of uh, cleansing uh, cleaning process uh, in in order to connect them. And uh, one thing that is interesting about this AI, because uh, AI can help uh, the people in the hospital, which is uh, not business analyst or not uh, data scientist yeah ai can help to analyze the data and find a lot of more insight yeah without the help of data uh, scientists this is uh, my experience and by, by uh, proving that ai can help them uh, the the leadership in the hospital will will uh, will have a few okay this this is very important and we we have to make this priority and then they can move forward now uh, that is the challenge within the hospital. Now outside the hospital, okay, the, the other challenge, maybe the, the infrastructure within the hospital or the uh, computing facility is not enough, so they have to use cloud. But then uh, there is another challenge that the data must reside within the hospital or maybe the, data, the, the private data must reside within the country. But uh, the one that must reside in the hospital is uh, quite easy. They can use the on-prem uh, server. If they don't have the on-prem server, then the other alternative is to use the local colocation or the local cloud. Now, uh, this is possible uh, in today's situation because uh, the COVID make uh, our government think that uh, everything that can help us to solve the COVID must be prioritized. So even though maybe the regulation is not exist yet for the data, so medical data to be processed outside the hospital, but this is this is allowed now. So if we refer to the government, yeah, uh, there is a lot of uh, regulation, but uh, in the uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Health, Health Edu uh, Ministry of Health Regulation, it's a lack of regulation related to how the data can be processed. So now uh, we are working closely with the Ministry of Healthcare and uh, how to identify which regulation in, is missing and maybe we can uh, ident we can uh, recommend them to make the new regulation and uh, other than that uh, our government already aware that we need the uh, uh, personal data uh, protection regulation and it's being uh, it's uh, is in the progress yeah still in draft but hopefully by this year, we will have a draft regul. We will have a regulation for personal data protection, and maybe some other regulation related to the health. So uh, once we have that, then in terms of regulation, it is uh, ready. Then uh, the hospital can move forward with the uh, aligning with the regulation. And uh, there is another challenge in the hospital: the people. So uh, we we need to educate the people how to read the data, how to process the data. But the good thing about AI is AI help them to uh, to get insight. Yeah. So we don't need people who understand well uh, Python or something like that. We just need a good software with the AI uh, capability that help them to analyze the data. Of course, if they want to do machine learning, etc., they can do it uh, on prem or in the cloud. If in the public cloud is not possible, then they must learn about uh, 
how to do the program in Python and do machine learning and then uh, you know analyze the data and uh, 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 make it available uh, through the business intelligence uh, software. So uh, I think this approach work. Yeah. Currently, I'm working with one of one hospital in Jakarta. Hopefully, uh, in the next uh, several months, uh, this will be finished. And if this is finished, then maybe we can have a model that work in the hospital area. And uh, uh, hopefully, other hospital can also learn from this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Tony. So, uh, last question, Mr. Stig. So, government, provincial government, collect a lot of data, right? So. I think you have one of the most uh, people in Indonesia, the province, right? West Java province have the most people in one province and you collect all the data. Uh, my question is actually to, and, and this also uh, to summarize all the, uh, this um, conversations uh, because we are approaching to the end of the uh, our session. Uh, you can also put a final statement uh, in, in the end how how you manage with uh, perhaps with ai or something to to help collect all this true data yeah thank you uh Bimo. actually some of uh how we collect is uh, we use like a, for example like ways yeah we use the ways also for the tra for the traffic and we use the video analytics to detect the violation uh, of health protocols and what's more important is hop. You know, the hop is uh, increasing after the COVID. We have around 5,000 hops uh, information yeah, on last year. And the, the issue is uh, how we can use the AI to detect. Uh, we call the hop analyzers yeah, to detect this is the hop information or not. And also, the uh, we, we use the media social or mobility for the people. We use this for the prediction of the COVID-19 risk area. So we can uh, forecast uh, about uh, six months for the hotspot or the, the risk area using the epidemic geomedals. Uh, we use the machine learning Gaussian regression pipelines. And other thing for the media analytics, yeah, to monitor the trends, uh, the negative or positive uh, currency in the news. And using this, uh, so we can gather the more information and then we also use the AI and machine learning to uh, give us some, uh, I mean, uh, like a recommendation, some perspective uh, for the uh, analytics. I think that's it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stiaji. So, uh, final statement from Mr. Ramprakas about security, perhaps, and Mr. Bima later on. Uh, perhaps you want to uh, share about the the, the, the insight and scaling that you already shared, and Mr. Tony. Uh, yeah, again, your final statement about the digital transformation in healthcare. So, Mr. Ramprakas, Mr. Bima, and Mr. Tony, please. Perfect. So, so security threats are looming. Uh, so, our mitigation threat uh, mitigation idea should also grow better with AI coming in. Security threats are evolving with AI. So the same thing we should be able to mitigate. That would be my final statement. Thank you. Mr. Bima? All right, for me, um, you know, organize your data carefully, organize information carefully. Uh, at the end of the day, optimize for speed. At, uh, you know, the things that, that, that you, at the end of the day, you wanna use your data to create impact. Um, so you have to optimize from speed from your data coming in to impact being generated outside uh, in your organization. Yeah, last but not least, Mr. Tony, please. Okay, so AI is one enabler to do the digital transformation along with other technology, cloud, uh, data analytics. Uh, AI make data analytics easier and more fun to use uh, for business decision maker. AI implementation make everything simple yeah, without uh, violating regulation. So even in the regulations uh, in the healthcare sector, we can implement AI and cloud using hybrid cloud that combine the benefits of uh, public and on-premise solution. So uh, my closing, uh, closing statement will be, there is no better time to implement AI today. Let's start to implement it even in the healthcare sector. Yeah, thank you so much all panelists. I will uh, give back to Bavana. 
Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhima. Firstly, for moderating it so wonderfully. I just have a couple of minutes uh, for the Q&A. So I'll quickly shoot it out uh, to all our eminent panelists. First up, there's a question which has uh, come down from uh, Isabel. And Isabel asked that, what about the privacy data? All those AI system track, compile and analysis, all our body, what is the user if it has any complaint? Since there's no contract between them. Uh, Ram Prakash, would you like to first take that? Uh, what's your view on that question? Sure, data privacy is a very important aspect. Uh, there has to be all of the PAI data that has been removed so that uh, the system just looks at your blood sugar levels as blood sugar levels and not blood sugar levels of Ram Prakash. So uh, probably a gender marker and an age marker, but all PAI data should be properly vetted. And that is what all governments are trying to do. There's been a lot of regulations around these days because we are at that point in time where uh, everybody is aware on the kind of data they create and how businesses use it. So it is only very important to bring in an enhanced version of HIPAA maybe to make sure algorithmic decision making is addressed with proper privacy aspects. Sure, thank you so much. And just one final question, uh, quickly, uh, one minute on that. Question from Park Bhima for uh, Bukalpik, uh, wherein it, they say that, can you share what base elements or sources can be used to build the information infrastructure that you've mentioned? All right, so, I mean, uh, for Bukalpak, we're, we're fortunate to work on um, on cloud premise. So, sorry, on cloud um, technology. So we use GCP for a lot of it. Um, a lot of the on cloud solutions, not just uh, Google Cloud Platform offer um, a lot of organizational data um, services. So I know AWS has an equivalent service. Uh, Snowflake also has an equivalent service. So look into these um, providers and they can do this. Um, they would have a certain level of organizing data uh, tooling. So just ask them when you are considering any vendor, just ask them, well, if a, a, a person is gonna access this data set and this person is not a data scientist or a data analyst, this person is a business person, how would you organize information for them? Like that's a very important question to ask any vendor when you're considering the business and BI or uh, business analytics. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, with this, we conclude with our eminent uh, panel discussion. Thank you once again for your valuable time. And we're right now on track to start with our next discussion. Thank you once again. Thank you.